wish you could have left you a bit of curtsy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Jill, for welcoming me to your beautiful library. And thank you very much, Phil, for inviting me. I know it's a busy time for bookstores, and uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. I know how busy everybody is. And it's just lovely of you to come. It still amazes me that people would be interested to read anything that I've written. <laughs> I must say it seems a long way from Main Street, Maranda, the little town that I grew up in at the top of the Hunter Valley. So thank you very, very much indeed. I, um, I've been to uh, Melbourne uh, for a few days talking about the, the new book. And um, uh, somebody, a young person, came up to me at one of the book signings in Melbourne and said, look, I'm really too young to remember who you were. <laughs> and she said, my grandfather loves you. <laughs> and he's been in love with you for years. <laughs> so would you sign this book for him? <laughs> so I, it just reminded me that I have indeed been around a long time. <laughs> Four Corners at, at this day tonight, as Phil mentioned, and, and some years on uh, ABC Radio, Search for Meaning. And to my amazement, it's now 10 years since the first Australian story went to air. Yes, that's remarkable, isn't it? I think it was May 1996. Um, and the joy of that experience is that people seem to get so much pleasure out of watching the program, uh, which is just marvellous. Um, our production manager, Anita Atkins, was on holiday recently in Mufti, you know, I mean, she, no, she, no, no one could see that she had anything to do with Australian story. Anyhow, she went to the Buckingham Caves, which is a very beautiful spot in Victoria. Mm. And as the, she was with a group having a tour, and as the guide came to the end of his uh, description of the beautiful Buckingham Caves, he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time now to return to the bus. And Anita heard one of the tourists turn to her companion and say, Thank heavens for that. We'll be back at the motel in time to watch Australia. <laughs> <laughs> this was wonderful. <laughs> and I did too. <laughs> and I was in the, at the skin cancer clinic the other day. You know how we have to go for our regular checkup. I do find it, I mean, it's not funny, but sitting in the waiting room, all these sort of people of my complexions are the patients. And we're all sitting around with our various complaints and waiting and hoping that it won't be too frightful. And it just amuses me that every time one of the young medicos comes out to get the next patient at this clinic anyhow, they are the most beautiful young people. And a number of them are young Asian doctors and they have this beautiful, gorgeous <laughs> skin. You know, not a sign of any blemish or skin cancer, and we're, I'm sitting around, you know, looking like a lizard. I think a lot of us look like lizards because we, we sunbake too much in our impressionable youth. Anyhow, that's not the point of the story is that somebody, one of my fellow patients said to me, um, I just loved the Australian story last night because uh, it was the one about the women who had had breast cancer and as part of their recovery they'd taken to the dragon boat racing. Mm. Yes. Oh, Remember that was yes. wonderful. Yes. Anyhow, one of these fellow patients had tears in his eyes and he said, we love that story. Because he said, my wife's had breast cancer. And he said, just seeing those women and their families portrayed in that story, it just made me feel kind of relieved as though people would understand how hard it has been for us and how brave people are when they go through this and, and, and how difficult it is for their families and so on. So I thought that was wonderful. And he said, but of course now my wife wants to take to the dragon boat. <laughs> <laughs> and that started a conversation going in the waiting room. And somebody else said, oh, yes, he said, I enjoyed that too, but my favourite one was that we were like a little Australian story club there. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the doctor's waiting room, which passed the time pleasantly before we went in and got zapped. <laughs> but it was lovely, that feeling of, you know, swapping stories and names as though we knew the people who'd been in the program, as though they were somehow our friends, as though we were perhaps at a school reunion. 
uh, remembering people. You know, people we don't actually know, but we do know them. And I just found that really a lovely experience. What interests me is um, that we too, we who make the programs, have been changed by making them. And I'm thinking of um, Claire Foster, one of our most wonderful producers. She wrote on, uh, she has written in her chapter in the Australian Story Book a lovely little description. I wonder if you'll remember Carve Their Names with Pride. Beautiful story, quite an early one. And Claire, who's one of our producers, writes, um, Carve Their Names with Pride told the story of a group of students from North Mackay High School, Queensland, who were visiting the battlefields and cemeteries of Gallipoli in France. They were on a mission to find 98 headstones that marked the death in World War I of men and women who were ancestors of present-day Mackay residents. When the students returned to Mackay, they presented photographs of the gravestones to the siblings, children and grandchildren of those servicemen and women. It was a precious gift as many of the locals had never seen their loved one's last resting place. And Claire goes on to write, seeing those teenagers standing next to the graves, reading the headstones, being moved to tears and grieving for soldiers they had never met made me realise once again what a privilege it is to work on a program where people accept your presence during intensely emotional and personal journeys. And she says that she's a young woman with uh, uh, two little children. I don't know how these girls do everything today. They do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, she's changed her life uh, just working on the program. I'm sure we could all say the same thing. We just all think we've got the best job in the industry and we know how fortunate we are to be part of this program. What interests me is why people respond so in such a heartfelt way to many of the programs. And I'd like to explore the reason for that because I think the reason touches each one of us personally in our own lives. I mean, it's true that Australian story is entertaining to watch. But there's also usually something very satisfying about the programs. And I wonder what that is. Uh, I think it's to, to do just with the power of the story. There is something about a story that communicates very readily to the human psyche or the human imagination, more readily than, say, oh, I don't know, a mathematical formula or a lecture about <laughs> Albert Einstein or a lecture on psychology, important and interesting those those things are. Um, I think that the, the power of the story, you know, if you think of the Bible, Old and New Testament, almost all written in story form, every television drama, uh, it's, it's a story, isn't it? Um, and, and I suppose I've got a theory I'd like to try out on you, and I'll begin it by telling you a story, of course, how else? Some of you will have heard it before, maybe from me. I just love this story. I got it from uh, Patty Miller, who, among other books, has written that beautiful book, Writing Your Life. You may be familiar with that. And she got it from an American teacher called Barbara Meyerhoff. And Barbara Meyerhoff was teaching a course in urban anthropology, which sounds very American. I suppose it's the study of people in the city, is it? <laughs> urban <laughs> anthropology. Anyhow, she gave an assignment to her students, and this was it. She said, I want you to go and find somebody who lives a life very different from your own and draw out that person's story and write that story down as fully as you can. That's your assignment. So off they went. And one student had terrific trouble with this. And the deadline was coming closer and he had done nothing about it. He was quite from quite a wealthy family. He lived in a lovely, palatial, comfortable home, and he actually didn't very often encounter anybody who lived a life very different from his own. So the night before the assignment was due, he was pretty desperate, and suddenly along the corridor of his home, he saw Maria. And Maria was the Guatemalan immigrant home help who lived in their house and did the cleaning and the cooking and the mending and many other things to make life comfortable for that family. And he got an inspiration. He thought, well, she lives a life very different from mine. And rather tentatively, he went along the corridor and he said to her, Maria, could you, would you tell me something of your story? 
Well, she looked a bit startled and she put down the broom and she drew herself up to her full height, which wasn't very high. And she sighed and she said, oh yes, I can tell you my story. Because every night before I go to sleep, I go over my story in every detail. And I do that to keep it all together, just in case one day someone might ask me to tell it. Gracias a Dios. <laughs> so she looked so poor and so little and had so little in the way of material wealth and yet it seems to me she had a great richness inside in conserving and honouring and acknowledging her story with all its loss. She had in a sense conserved her very self I think. You know, it's a hard thing, isn't it, to have to move from one country to another for whatever good reasons you do it. There must be always a sense of exile about it, the loss of one's language, family, culture, everything that's familiar. So I love that story. For all that she had lost, you know, she still had that precious story. And, you know, everyone has a story. Every story is unique and has its own special value and I often wonder do you acknowledge and conserve your story as Maria did no one else can live your story and your story your life has its own particular contribution its own particular gift to make to the world without it there would be an irreplaceable gap in the world it's a very obvious thing to say, I know, but not everybody actually understands it. And I suppose that's why suicide or the death of a young person is so heart-wrenching because, well, because that person's story was not fully told, did not come to fruition, did not come to fulfilment. Adopted people often come to the point, don't they, where at a certain time in their life suddenly they need to know and they go looking for the original family called the birth family, I think, isn't it? And of course, migrant, you know, people who have come from another country, sometimes, not always I know, but sometimes get the, uh, the desire to go back, to find that part of the story that they've left behind. I uh, remember an interview I had with Magda Berzik years ago on radio on the search for meaning. She was a migrant to Australia who, as a young woman, had lost many of her family in the bombing of Budapest during the Second War. She took the huge step of migrating to Australia and made a home and started a new family in Canberra. But one day, 20 years after her arrival in this country, something happened which gave her an urgent desire to go back. Well, she spoke to me in that world-weary Middle European accent that I must say I find very attractive. And she said, I won't attempt the accent, um, there was one day when there was a really big snowfall in Canberra and I walked out and saw the snowflakes falling and I thought, I must go back. I haven't seen snow in all those years and I must go back. I went back to Hungary. My, my, my wonderful husband and brother understood my need to go and they financed the journey. And after 20 years waiting, there is written up on that airport in glittering letters, Budapest. And I stepped off the plane, clutching all the presents I had for everybody. And all my friends were there. The babies they were holding in their arms when I left were now young women, and they were holding their own babies in their arms. They are all waiting for me. It was an incredible moment of time. I walked slowly as if my legs were lead because I knew this would never happen again. It was such a mixed, wonderful trip when I came across something that spoke to me in my own old language. I wept and wept and wept every time. I walked up into the hills. There was an old oak tree and I found on it a heart, the heart which represented the first love of my life with an arrow across which we had carved out. <laughs> Then suddenly there was a war. Millions of people died. The city collapsed, but the big oak tree stands there with our heart and cross on it. Details like that really ring your heart. 
you walk up to the hills and look down on that city and from there is this misty outline of that place you love so much. I had returned, but I didn't really belong there anymore. I walked around and just let the memories of the reality mix and I started to miss my husband and son back in Canberra. Mm -hmm. So in life you gain things and things are taken from you, but it's all part of your story. Beautiful. Now sometimes people say to me, where do you find those interesting people for Australian story? Um, of course, I don't have a story. I'm just a housewife and mother, or I'm just a retired engineer, or, you know, and it just, it's like an arrow to the heart to me. And I just think it's really bad thinking because it's not true. And of course, that's what I'm exploring in An Authentic Life. I wrote it, this, this one, I wrote it as an invitation to the reader to reflect seriously on your own story, to believe that you have a story, to trust, <coughs> that, you, to trust that it has a meaning, and to make a deeper discovery of your own gifts, your own talents, and your own inner resources. I wrote it as an encouragement to live life to the full, whatever your circumstances, to be true to yourself, to live with meaning and purpose and gladness, and I mean, I wrote it not to preach, but because, I mean, that's my quest, you know. How to live a life of integrity and, a, you know, a real life with courage and compassion and interest in other people. And I, I really don't make any claim to have all the answers, but I am deeply interested in those questions. How to live an authentic life with integrity and purpose. How to find hope and courage in the face of suffering and change how to feel happy and at home in myself, how to live with compassion for others and with a sense of belonging. So I, I, I just offer you this book as a companion to your own search for meaning, if it appeals to you. Uh, this book offers my company and that of others whom I have interviewed as we describe our milestones and discoveries and how we've faced the hard times and how at times all we could manage was just to survive where we have found solutions, how we've kept our faith in life even when it was tested, how we found a bit of peace of mind and some reassurance that we do matter, that we are doing our best, and that we are not alone in our endeavors. So important, isn't it? Just to have a feeling that you're not alone and that life is worth living. So look, if there's someone you know who's having a bit of a struggle, this may be a gently encouraging gift for them. I don't know. You've got to be very careful giving books to people, haven't you, in case it seems like a, I don't know, an imposition or something. Um, the book is also written as a guide to keeping a journal or scrapbook, which is a way of conserving one's story, and as a resource for small group discussion. And it's used all around the country for that purpose. I had a lot of letters. This book was first published in 1998. And as Phil has said, this is a second edition. So if you read it in 1998, you don't need to write, read it again. If you know, you know, it's the same book with a new introduction <laughs> and a different cover. You're putting yourself down. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, honestly. But I don't want you to be buying something under false pretenses because it looks different. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> I got some lovely letters after the book was published, and one of the many came from seven from one woman who was part of a book group in outback Queensland. And these seven women travelled, I, I don't even know how many hours, occasionally, to get together, you know? You can just visualise them driving through the dust to get together, to have each other's company for one day every month, I think they did. And uh, they put, the, they used The Authentic Life as one of their books for discussion. And um, they, they really enjoyed it. She said to me, Sylvia, her name was, and Sylvia said, we, the questions that you posed to us made us share our stories with each other in a way that we hadn't quite done before. We'd known each other for many years, but this kind of pushed it a bit further and a bit closer, and I was really thrilled about that. Well, um, these two books are cousins. <laughs> These two books are cousins. 
they don't really look like cousins, but they are, <laughs> they are cousins. I'll just explain that. An authentic life grew out of, and, and by the way, Phil very kindly said it, it's an autobiography. Look, it is in the sense that it has got some of my story in it, but I would never write an autobiography and call it an authentic life. <laughs> it's been a bit embarrassing, you know. Well, what, the, what the title means is, how do we, it's like a question, how are we to live an authentic life? That's really what it means. I wanted to call the book A Companion to the Search for Meaning, because that's what I think it is, but anyhow, it wasn't a suitable. <laughs> it wasn't quite right, anyhow. But An Authentic Life grew out of the radio series The Search for Meaning, which was on the air from 87 to 94. Eight years of storytelling, and I had the privilege of listening to the life experiences of my countrymen and women in all their variety, week after week. Those wonderful talks were broadcast across the continent on Radio National, on that ephemeral yet powerful medium of, of radio waves. And these stories, I think, seeped into our national consciousness. People taped them and shared them and talked to each other about them. And I remember that we laughed and we cried as we discovered how people had negotiated their perilous turning points. And we heard the insights they'd gained as a consequence. The search for meaning revealed Australians as articulate and thoughtful, spiritual and resilient people. And the telling of the stories drew, drew a powerful response. Many, many wrote to us as though a, to tell a story invites a story, and I do really believe that <coughs> happens. Wonderful letters. So the search for meaning was actually one of the inspirations for Australian story. The search for meaning and a big country. Remember a big country? A beautiful program. And that's how I came to be involved when Deborah Fleming, one of the ABC's current affairs producers, was invited to start a new current affairs program. Um, she took a fresh approach to the job. She thought that, well, she suspected the audience was tired of confrontation and also tired of reporters dominating programs. And she talks about this in her chapter in the book. It's very interesting how she, you know, what she was attempting to create. Um, so for Australian story, her reporters had to learn a new skill in a way. They had to convert into listeners, keep in the background behind the camera, to help the subject of the Australian story tell it in their own words and to find visual ways to give the person's story depth and a context. So the reporters became producers, enhancing, illuminating and expanding current affairs reporting by lending to important issues greater depth in human interest uh, by providing a wealth of background. For instance, in this uh, Australian story behind the scenes book, one chapter is written by Matt Naffin. I don't, have anyone got their copy of the book yet? No? Okay. Well, um, this is a, he's a wonderful man. You probably, some of you may, you would know him. He, he talks about being the subject of an Australian <coughs> story. There are three chapters in here which are written by people who've been the subject. Matt Laffin is a young lawyer who works in the office of the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions in Sydney. He's, he has a, a happy and hectic social life. He ran for Lord Mayor of Sydney a few years ago. He's on the rugby uh, judiciary. All this despite a severe disability. His very short stature and the use of an electric wheelchair make him look very, very different and present him with an enormous <coughs> challenge every day of his life from the moment he wakes up. So uh, uh, you may have seen that as this Australian story. But as we see the story unfold, we're moved, engaged, and of course educated about the life of a person living with a severe <coughs> disability in a way which is more touching and powerful, I think, than hearing an expert speak about the needs of persons who are disabled. <coughs> of course, the expert uh, would make his own, her own important contribution too. I'm not denying that. But I think it's the, it's the real life story that grabs our attention first. It's, it's the man's tremendous laugh and his zest for life. It just lifts your spirits. And there are some beautiful photographs here of Matt Laffin uh, with some of his friends. Uh, his story is a blueprint for how to approach <coughs> suffering with hope and courage. And don't we all need that, whatever our particular suffering or challenge uh, might be. And I think that's one of the values of Australian story, that it goes beyond the 
presentation and analysis of a problem into the exploration of possible solutions. I really like being part of that. Uh, and to come to my theory about why we find the Australian story <coughs> satisfying, I do believe we're compelled by each other's stories because they tell us much about ourselves. Each one of us is a story in the making, as it were. And these Australian stories give us important clues about the puzzle of what it is to be human and how to negotiate the adventure creatively and with courage and compassion. I mean, I know I wonder as I watch, how on earth would I cope with that disgrace? You know, do I have that resilience, that generosity? Would I give a kidney to somebody else? Do I have that capacity for forgiveness? that joy in being alive? Could I survive that setback or be happy under those circumstances? But then I watch how they do it and I learn rich lessons for myself and I remember them later. So I suppose I think of the stories uh, as maps which people have drawn through their own hard-won experience to chart their course in life and which they share with us. The stories are all the more valuable for the inclusion of obstacles or failures. I mean, you might not even like or approve of some of the people on the program, I think, but, but you learn from them, <clears throat> even, if, even if you learn what not to do. These stories ask the questions we all ask. Who am I and where am I going and what's it all about and how do I make my contribution to, uh, to a better world? All the stories together with respect and fascination for their differences are what go to make up our culture. And I suppose what you don't see on Australian story is uh, what happens behind the scenes. So that's really what the book is about, you know, um, how we make the programs. So Matt Laffin and Dr. Michael Holt uh, reveal their experiences of being the subject of a program. We might love to watch the story, but you know, What's it like with the cameras turned on you? Um, you remember Michael Holt, perhaps. Uh, he's on the cover of the book. He was the head of orthopedics at the uh, Royal Brisbane Hospital. Mm -hmm. One day went out into the street and was knocked over by a car. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, had a, just, just his, his perfect life was just absolutely shattered. What would it be like for a doctor to be a patient? I thought that was one of the most fascinating parts of it. And, what would the future be? And would he ever be able to be a surgeon again? And what was it like for him to take part in that Australian story and watch? Do you remember one of his theatre sisters? Mm. Remembering what an arrogant person mm. he could be sometimes in theatre. <laughs> Rather confronting, I thought. Yes. By the same token, she was inspired by him, arrogance and all, to take up medical studies herself, which are going very well, by the way. Mm. So, uh, so that was exciting. So behind the scenes, that's where we're going um, with the book. Um, you'll find out how these remarkable stories are made and how ordinary people like you and me are encouraged and supported to tell the stories with such unusual candor. It's not easy for them. I think you become vulnerable when you share something with your story, don't you? It's risky. And you'll find out about how we research the stories. There's uh, one chapter which gives a cameraman's point of view. Um, you read how arduous the whole process can be. Several, some of the stories take uh, several years to make. Um, uh, there's a very interesting one written by Vanessa Gorman. Vanessa produced the story about Wayne Bennett, which I think has been one of the great favorites to see that granite-faced person who everyone in the media is really scared of, um, to see really what his life is like with his wife and his and two of his children who have disability and, you know, just to see underneath the exterior and to be given um, an insight into his family life, I, I found absolutely wonderful. Uh, so Vanessa produced that and a number of our other very fine Australian stories. And then she, in another chapter, transforms from producer into subject of a story as she tells of the birth of her second baby, Raphael, after the grief of losing her first, uh, first child. 
you, you may remember seeing that one. So I was going to mention some of the other stories specifically, but I think it's better for me to just wait and see what you may like to, to um, ask me. So there it is, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the program, published by ABC Books, Australian Story Behind the Scenes. And if you enjoy the program on television, I hope, I hope, I think you would enjoy the book. Um, and if it's, uh, you know, it's entertaining, but it also helps us to know better our fellow Australians. And I think there's something sustaining about it in meeting the challenge of our own lives. Um, there are also two volumes of Australian stories on CDs. Um, that's right, and a DVD of four of the stories. And um, I'd be so happy to answer any questions or hear any observations you, you may like to make. And later, very happy to sign one or both of the books, perhaps for you or for someone um, as a gift. Uh, if, you, if you do watch the program, we've got repeat programs running on Saturday lunchtimes at the moment, 12.30 Saturdays. And then from the middle of January, We'll, play, we'll come back onto Monday nights and play three favourite programs. Do you remember Mac and Gail Shan? She was that beautiful young woman. She and her husband are on an outback property. They're working one morning with a post hole digger. Yeah. A shocking accident. And she lost one arm. Oh dear, what a story. And uh, that marvellous young husband, Mac, has done everything you know that he can to, to care for her. I always remember something in that story he said. He looked so young and it was such a terrible thing that had happened to him. I remember him saying, well I said, I said for better or worse, in sickness and in health, and I meant it. Mm -hmm. And boy did he need to mean it. So that story is going to be one of the ones that's on on a Monday night in January with a little update on how they're going now, which I know people would be interested to see. And oh, the Peter Andrews story, remember that man up in the Hunter Valley who had 30 years of ridicule and so on for his methods of restoring ravaged land? That one's on again. And thirdly, I think the young woman who brought together all the people who've been involved in a car crash outside Burke. Do you remember that? Quite extraordinary reconciliation. Um, so look, the books, the books, there they are. I've told you a little, a little something about them. I'm mad about stories, as you know, the personal story. I think that the telling of a personal story is a generous gift. It's a glimpse of their heart and soul. And it renders them vulnerable, but it makes our society stronger. For the truthful telling of our human experience lays a pathway on which we may walk forward together with trust and confidence, I think. Thank you so much. Over to you. I'd like to hear what you think. Caroline, I assume you and your team seek out people, you know, to find out more about their stories, but does it ever happen that people might offer their story to you? It has happened a, a, a couple of times. It's more common. The question was, do people ever offer their own story, or telling on Australian story? It's not very often, but people do recommend others mm. whom they know or they know of, and that has resulted in several of a, a very, very good stories. I mean, the problem really is an embarrassment of riches. There are so many possibilities out there. I mean, you, we all would know a dozen more people who would make a wonderful Australian story. It sounds like the five ladies in Queensland, eh? Right? Yes, wouldn't that be good? <laughs> the story, the, the, we're thinking that the seven outback property women in Queensland, wouldn't that be wonderful mm -hmm. as they're travelling in to, towards each other, yes, and bringing up the, the, the stories of the different families, wouldn't that be wonderful? How would you do that in half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> it would challenge though. Mm -hmm. What a good idea, thank you. <coughs> I hadn't quite thought that. Mm -hmm. 
Gentlemen, you seem to be, with the greatest respect, <coughs> a, a private person. How did you uh, <coughs> balance giving of yourself in, in the authentic life <coughs> as part of your autobiography? Mm -hmm. Was that hard to reveal? <coughs> yes. Um, yes, I know exactly what you mean. Um, just the suggestion that as a fairly private person and an introvert myself, <coughs> That's my word. I know you didn't say that, but I am. Uh, how would I? What, what was it like for me trying to tell something of my story in authentic life? Well, you know, I just... It's a bit personal, this, but... Um, some of you know that... Um, some of you know that my mother uh, took her own life. And it really broke my heart because I felt, you know, she... But, you don't really ever know another person's story and you do not know why somebody does it. So I would never even pretend to say that. But when you see somebody lose hope and lose the possibility of going on, it's just terrible. And I think, you know, part of that, it happens in our young people a lot now. They just can't find a way to go on. And I just wonder if part of that isn't not really having faith or confidence in one's own story. And at some point, I don't know, out of the grief or the heartbreak, at some point it came to me that one of the most genuine things you actually can give, in fact it might be, no it's not the only thing, but it's a really genuine thing you can give is your own story or your version of your own story. Because it's real and it's heartfelt and it comes out of your experience and it's something like that. This is a bit of a scrappy answer, but it was something like that. And I thought if I've got a job to do, it's to encourage anyone who would, might listen to have confidence in their own story and to understand that your life matters. It's not just a matter of no consequence. It's not something that can be through. Um, we can't do without it. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, not everyone knows that. So I think I came to the point where I thought my job is to be an encourager along those lines. And I really think that's actually what my work is about. Does that I mean, make all, sense? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. and, and I think using the word courage, it seems to me you took a lot of courage on your part. <coughs> To um, did it take, take courage on my part? I think once you get a passion for something, <coughs> once you get an idea of your own vocation, is that word all right? Your mm. own purpose, mm. uh, and I suppose we have a number of purposes in life, especially at different stages. But once you get the, you know, when you get the bit between your teeth and you think, this is what I want to do, this is my job, this is what I can do, I think then you've got a lot of energy for it. And I mean, I, I started as a very shy child. I walked around with mum and sometimes dad at the age of 17 trying to get a cadetship on a newspaper. Well, no one would look at me. I mean, I wouldn't have looked at me either. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was shy and, you know, I mean, really, you know, haters. So, um, it's funny, but I think out of shyness as a child also, you might learn to listen because you don't know what to say. <laughs> But you find out you can be part of things by just listening. Everyone loves a listener. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I think everything that happens go, is some little bit of learning. It's something like the bird gathering all these bits and pieces and there they all are in the nest. And if you looked at it, you'd think, what a funny mess. But it's all learning, don't you think? You know, hardly any experience is wasted, even the ghastly things. Pretty good on the questions, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, uh, two questions. One, do you think we'll ever see an Australian story on Caroline Jones? You certainly will not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I just, will we ever see an Australian story on Caroline Jones? Look, they got me for This Is Your Life. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> And I, can I just say something about that? Because I think it's quite interesting. This is your life, tricks you. <laughs> it's a secret. All, all sorts of people around you 
um, may are sworn to secrecy, and they. I can't tell you what a feeling of betrayal it is. <laughs> I think some people might like it, and, so, and, and you have to respond to it with good grace because you know people meant well. But the difference between that and what we do mm. is we do by choice, by invitation. Would you like to share? What would you like to share? You know, it's a big difference. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. And from 1972, so with you and Bob Robertson Royal till today, why is the ABC so good at this sort of thing? At what sort of thing? At putting shows like this together compared to ABC. I don't think anybody else could do it. Like Australian Story. Mm. I don't know. I but do. thank goodness that they do. Yeah. <laughs> I think I do. So do you're I. Not, you're not voyeuristic. Yeah. You don't go into the seamy side of things. You tell the truth the way it is. Well, we do a bit. I mean, you think some of those Australian stories are a bit grim. Yes, but, but that's you... different. You're not you're not seeking that sensational. Thank you. I hope that's right. Thank you. I think you attract a different type of journalist. A journalist uh, with depth, often with a sense of mission. The Andrew Ollies. I can't name. I mean. All of you presumably listen to ABC radio and watch television. The journalists that go, that are drawn to the ABC, that are attracted to the ABC, mm. that are paid less at the ABC, yes. are a different type of person, are a person with, an, with a sense of mission, <coughs> with an ideal that journalism has to serve the public interest mm. and not <coughs> be a vehicle for narcissists. And the vital difference between Australian Story and every other program on television in this country is that it goes to the soul and the mind and the spirit of the subject mm. and it's not about self-promotion mm. it's not about conflict uh, in the sense of um, inflaming conflict yes we do see conflict but we try to see a resolution of it and uh, i thank you for it with all my heart because thank i'm you. an ardent viewer of it thank you, thank you. Thank you.